the inside story on the issues that affect you and your community. This is Local 12 Newsmakers. Good morning and welcome to Local 12 Newsmakers. I'm Dan Hurley. It's crunch time. In Columbus, the state legislature has to complete Ohio's next two-year budget by next Thursday, June 30th. At City Hall, council has to arrive at an agreement about property tax rates. That, in turn, sets the context for the level of cuts that will be necessary when the final two-year city budget is due at the end of the calendar year. This morning, Newsmakers is devoted to discussions of the state and city budgets on the eve of final decisions. We begin with the state budget. The election last November resulted in Republican sweep in Columbus. Governor John Kasich is working with the General Assembly in which Republicans hold a 59 to 40 seat majority in the House and a 23 to 10 majority in the Senate. A new two year uh, state budget must be adopted by this Thursday, June 30th, for the beginning of the new fiscal year the next day. Both the Senate and the House have adopted budgets, and over the last several weeks, a conference committee made up of members of both houses has been working to iron out differences. To discuss the final negotiations and possible implications of the new budget, I have invited two local members of the House of Representatives. Peter Stoutberg is a Republican who represents the 34th House District, which covers much of eastern Hamilton County. Mr. Stoutberg lives in Anderson Township and is an attorney with Fifth Third Bank. And Connie Pillick a Democrat who represents the 28th district that stretches across portions of northern Hamilton County. Ms. Pillick uh, lives in Montgomery. She is an attorney as well, but in private practice. Welcome to Newsmakers, Peter, and welcome back, Connie. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. Okay, um, both the Senate and the House have passed versions. Uh, and there's basic things that we know are going to be there. So uh, privatizing the state prisons, uh, a certain number of the state prisons, transferring um, state liquor profits to this new Jobs Ohio. Certain things are, you know. But there, there are areas that are differences between the House and the Senate version. Peter, from your perspective, what are the most important of those differences? What are you looking for? What are you personally concerned about? Uh, how it comes out. Well, thank you, Dan, for having us, first of all. Um, there are a number of, of, it's a moving target, really. There are a number of things that are being discussed on the, the larger uh, level. What is happening is we're seeing a, an increase in revenues, and that's why the Senate is able to add more to their budget process. So how to allocate those funds, uh, the additional revenues we are expecting is, is a large part of it. Uh, one big difference that um, really impacts local levels is uh, an amendment in the Senate that Senator Bill Seitz put in with respect to how to allocate the local government fund. Uh, as you know, local government fund was uh, significantly cut, 25% in the first year and an additional 25% in the second year. Um, some of the additional money they're looking at giving more to the local government fund or doing something to help local governments. And Senator Seitz had a, a, uh, an amendment to reallocate how local government fund is distributed within the county and among the cities. That is different from the House version, and I think there is a, a good fight going on in Columbus about whether it's time to um, modernize how those allocations are made. Now, I, I want to make clear, neither of you are on the conference committee, so you're not in the, uh, well, we don't have smoke-filled rooms anymore, uh, but you're not in the room making the decision. So you you have to read a little bit around the edges as well. Connie. You're a Democrat. I pur purposely put up the splits in both of the houses. You, you're in the House of Representatives. What's the role of a minority member, especially in a year where the governor the, and the majorities of both of the houses are decisively in the hands of the other party? What role, what impact mm. can a Democrat have in this whole process? Well, that's that's a great question, and I think the budget that was proposed by the governor and has been passed by the two, two bodies illustrates very clearly that there are major ideological differences between last year's Democratic controlled House and this year's uh, Republican controlled every part, every stage of government, every branch of government. And in my, in my view, the budget that was presented is an abomination. It increases spending. The first uh, pardon me, the second largest increase in spending in the history of Ohio. It, uh, e even though we're in, supposed to be in this huge $8 billion deficit, How can we're, it be, we're spending and, more. And, and there, this is something that's 
been reported it's in the newspapers and I think it's confusing to people how can there be a growth in the budget at a time when I can tick mm -hmm. off all of the cuts that have mm -hmm. been made and we'll talk about some of those yeah. um, how does that happen where, well, where's the new money where's the money okay. going if it's not in schools local government you know, Peter was just saying mm -hmm. this major cut in local government but so where is it well Peter did did mention the first part we have had increase in revenues because our economy is starting to, to sputter to life here. We expect uh, a, a close to a billion dollars in increased tax revenues for this fiscal year, which ends next week. We uh, are the, the budget uh, raids, uh, the unclaimed funds fund, as well as refinancing bonds. It uh, takes several billion from schools, local governments, and libraries and uh, over a billion dollars in new fees. And that's, that makes up that $8 billion deficit. And then uh, the governor took an additional $5.5 billion in one-time federal money. Peter, do you have a different perspective on this budget, how it's put together, and um, you know, how all these numbers fit together? We, we always disagree on things, Dan, but uh, amicably so, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we, we are facing a time of um, very scarce resources and the governor and, and our house and the Senate I think did their very best to um, a very difficult task of allocating those scarce resources the eight billion dollar number um, which is uh, widely used and widely discussed is come about by the federal stimulus money that Ohio received in the last biennium um, the 1011 that money's not there um, this time around I think schools got over the two years 800 million dollars of that and then the state other got at other places. Um, with respect to the general revenue fund, fortunately we bottomed out in 2010 and we are starting to see an increase in revenues uh, without an increase in the tax rate. So that is good. That means our economy is going back up, personal spending is going back up, uh, sales tax and use tax is going back up. And we're allocating those the best we can. Um, so that's where some of the spending is, but you're right, there's still a, a vast decrease in what we are spending overall. Well, let me ask the, the question this way, uh, and we don't know exactly how some of these numbers, because the Senate, you know, has added uh, money back into the school budget from what the House did. Uh, same thing with local governments. Um, what, how many state paid employees schools, local government employees, library employees, how many state paid employees do you expect to lose their jobs as a result of these cuts? I, I don't. I'm scared. Innovation Ohio did an analysis and uh, uh, calculated about 51,000 jobs lost. If that number is accurate, and I, I've seen various numbers, but if that number is accurate, what's that do to our unemployment rate? Well, obviously there'll be 51,000 new, newly no, no, unemployed people. That's an people. absolute number, and but do you so know where it, what it does to the percentage? Yeah. No, no, can't um, answer that that type of detail. Although unemployment is something that we've been successful at, from our uh, highest rate of unemployment in March of 2009, I think it was 10.4 percent here in Ohio. We're down to 8.6 percent, so we've cut almost two uh, percentage points, which is which is a great improvement. What do you say, Peter, to? Um, local government officials who are going to lose, and I hear this a lot from township uh, trustees, managers of townships, small cities, uh, and we got a lot of those in Hamilton County. Wh what are they saying to you? What are you saying back about the sorts of cuts they're facing? Well, and, and it is a very difficult conversation. Um, I live in Anderson Township and I was out at their meeting last night. Um, some townships and villages and, and small cities do a better job of budgeting and anticipating. Fortunately, in Anderson Township, they do a very good job of, of anticipating those things. Um, others um, perhaps need to do a little bit of belt tightening. I would hope that most of, of the cuts that they would uh, have to incur would, if they have to do with employees, would be through um, you know, people voluntarily leaving, retiring, finding other jobs and that they wouldn't have the personal uh, human sacrifice. Can I piggyback on that? Sure. Because so, I have a couple of townships and 15 different communities and all together in my, my district, and some of my communities are going to be impacted severely by reducing the local government fund, by eliminating the estate tax, 
by uh, phasing change. out the tangible personal property tax. That's three huge hits that local governments get with no other revenue replacement. It's so terrible for them. What's a community in your district that you think is really going to face hard, hard times? Springfield Township. I talked with the uh, finance I director. Okay. I talked with the finance director personally. I talked with uh, the trustees. But, uh, the monies that they're going to get is going to cut 38 to 50 percent of their budget. And is that because Peter was saying, is that because they haven't managed it well in the past? I don't think so. I think Springfield Township is pretty modest if anybody who travels there. It's a beautiful township, but you know, it costs money to pave the roads. It costs money to mow the lawn in the public areas. You know, another twist on this, and it comes out more with the schools, and one of the things that I don't understand, I mean, it's hard times and we're, everybody knew we were going to go into a, a cut. I mean, everybody knew that. Um, what I, what I'm a little surprised at, and I want to find out what your reaction to this is, it seems to me the governor has basically said, especially to schools, that with these cuts, he hopes that local voters won't go back and then vote local taxes to replace these taxes. You know, that he doesn't, he really believes government should just shrink and, you know, doesn't want state taxes, state revenues to be replaced by local revenues. How do you feel about that? Well, I don't, I can't speak for the governor, obviously. Um, I believe that each school district and the residents in the school districts need to make the decision on what they want for their individual school districts. Some may be willing to pay more tax money to support uh, teachers and programs and activities, uh, others not so. I, I firmly believe that it is up to the local jurisdictions to make that uh, determination. But by repealing the uh, evidence-based model reforms we did last year and by severely cutting state funding to schools. We go back to the unconstitutional funding process for schools. I think funding our schools not only is it our constitutional duty, it's a moral obligation and an economic imperative. But we all know that the uh, Supreme Court ruled on that three times and the model didn't change. We, we changed it with the evidence-based model in 2009, well, yeah. which did pass constitutional muster. Yeah. But that's been repealed. Okay, I'm out of time. One final quick question. Any doubt that this is going to get done by June 30th? No doubt. Uh, I'm hoping next Tuesday we get it done because it has to go to the governor for his, his signature and hopefully no vetoes. Yeah, I, I, Republicans every place. I don't think there's much doubt that it's going to get happen. So yeah. thank you very much for being here this morning. Thanks, Thanks for Thanks, Dan. taking us through a lot of complicated information. So, and you'll be back. Thank you. Stay tuned. When we return, the critical decision facing the Cincinnati Council and Mayor that will set the context for the budget process later this year. Welcome back. The city of Cincinnati's fiscal year corresponds to the calendar year, so council does not have to complete a two-year budget until December, after the fall elections. But council must tell the Hamilton County Auditor what the property tax rate will be for the coming year. For over a decade, council has been rolling back its tax rate, but reached a point where it would generate $28.9 million a year. The city manager proposed increasing the tax rate to a maximum 6.1 mills to generate $32 million, which would leave the city with $25 million deficit to be closed in the new budget this fall. But a majority of council wants to keep the rate at 4.6 mills. Given falling property tax values, that will generate about $24 million, increasing the projected deficit that was to be closed by an additional $8 million to $33 million. Although a five-member uh, majority of council is ready to vote for this, Mayor Mark Mallory has suspended the final decision until this coming Wednesday. To discuss where we stand on the property tax rate and what might be cut from the operating budget to respond to the falling revenue, I am joined by Lori Quinlivan, a Democrat in her first term on city council, and Amy Murray, a Republican, who is also in her first term, having been appointed to the seat vacated by Chris Monzel uh, when he was elected Hamilton County Commissioner. Welcome back to both of you, back to, to Newsmakers. Thanks, Dan. Um, where exactly, Lori, do we stand with just dealing with this issue? There is a majority 
uh, Republican base with uh, uh, Chris Bortz, Charter Right added into it, 5-4 majority that wants to pass this. Mm -hmm. Where do we stand with it? This has got to be done by Wednesday, right? No, not by Wednesday. It has to be done by July 15th. So we could always actually come back in July and vote on Except it. Except you're on vacation. Technically, right. but you know, we can come back. And the strategy is, you know, the mayor's strategy is, let's let council members really think about this because uh, we see it as fiscally irresponsible to open up a further $8 million hole in the budget when we're already facing a $26 million hole. And my point is, to the average homeowner, let's say uh, the owner of a $100,000 house, we're talking about $2.40 a month or 30 bucks a year. They're not even going to notice that. But as a city, if we do what the conservatives on council want us to do, we're facing another $8 million cut that will impact city services. So you're on the Democratic side, the mayor's Democratic. Do you expect him to allow this to come up to a vote on a uh, council meeting this Wednesday? I'm not sure what he's going to do. But, you know, I think he's hoping that council members hear from people like we heard from people last night. Okay. So we went to the Invest in Neighborhoods annual meeting and all the community council presidents were there. And we actually talked about this, and most of them said they were in favor of us Just going so to the higher Just so people understand, rate. this is airing on Sunday, but we're taping on Friday morning. So you're talking right. about a meeting on Thursday night. Yeah. Amy, yes. you have a five to four majority at this point. You're part of that majority. Um, what's your attitude about the mayor's action in delaying this? You know, if the mayor wants to delay it, I think we have to vote on it this Wednesday because we have to put it forward. But, but our thoughts are, you know, the citizens of Cincinnati are already being taxed enough, and I keep hearing from people in my office, we don't want our property tax increase. We're going to have a $33 million budget deficit, and I don't think that we should put it on the backs of the taxpayers. We need to cut ourselves. I think the city well, it's needs all on the backs of the taxpayers. It's <laughs> yeah. government. No, but, but, and the point is, you know, it might be a cup of coffee, but we've been looking at, you know, let's institute, you know, we, we took out the yard waste this last time. So that's been put back in, but people want to have that as an extra uh, charge to people. We have the tree assessment. We have sanitation, you know, trash pickup. Wait a minute. Let's, let's stop with the tree assessment. Yeah. Uh, that's been around, I mean, I, I know where I lived when that went 30 in. 30 years. Yeah, yeah. Is it 30 years? Yeah. No, and okay. I voted and for it, but I'm saying if we add all these things to taxpayers every day, we're not then it. it's it not. Existed. That's already there. And, and, and just the same thing with this tax rate. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is a rate that city had gotten into this habit of rolling back yes. because money was coming in and they could roll it back. Mm -hmm. Now the money isn't coming in. This is not, these are not taxes that the city wasn't permitted to collect, yes. but now it's interpreted as a tax increase. I mean, that's, that seems to be But for me it is, strange. because ta the valuation of people's property in general went down 7%, but there's a lot of people whose taxes and valuations stayed the same or went up. So if we increase the millage, then those people are going to have a tax increase, and I'm flip, not willing to do that. Just flip that around for a moment on school levies and other mm -hmm. kinds of levies. As the rate goes down, the millage automatically goes up because it's for a certain amount of money. Yeah. Most people don't recognize that. We talked about it two weeks ago on the show. Uh, but, you know, so it seems to me this is a similar case. The, the property values are going down, therefore there's millage in place to allow it to roll up. But Milton wanted to roll it up. The city manager wanted to bring it all the way to the maximum of 6.1. So is there we're a compromise? seeing. You know what? The I, mayor I don't proposed a compromise. He did. He put something right in the middle, which would have meant we collect the same amount of money that we're collecting now. Now that is better than what the conservatives on council are pushing. It's not as good as what the city manager is proposing, which would actually help us move towards a balanced budget. But I think if we move the millage up, we're not going to be able to get a future council to move it down. And I'm just not in support of that type of tax increase. I mean, last year we had a budget deficit of 54 million. This year it's going to be 33 million, and we need to deal with let it me, in the city. Let me just suggest that for politicians who get elected every two years, it's always easy to move things down, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. So even if it went up for a while, if economic situations turn around, when economic situations turn around, let's be hopeful about this, uh, it will be politically possible to roll it back again. But, but, you know, I'm seeing right now that, you know, homeowners, they've lost valuation in the house, so on top of that, we're going to say, oh, and we're going to increase your taxes. You, you know, I, I just don't think we should be doing that, and I don't think that a future council, if the millage goes up to 6.1, will have the courage that it takes to lower it, because Would we'll be you? having that money and the we'll be having the spending. in this situation is to do the right thing for citizens of this city, 
and that is collect the money that we're owed. We're facing a $26 million budget deficit. It doesn't have to be $33 million. It's only $33 million if we do what the conservatives on so, council Okay, so do. the point is, even no matter what, there's at least a $26 million deficit, 25 yeah. point something million dollar deficit. That, that's minimum. So the question then becomes, what do you do about that? And um, Lori has produced, because of some work that she's been doing, and these come from Lori, Lori Quinlivan. They do not come from the manager's office. I just want to be clear about that. But there's a series of visuals that I find very interesting and I think help understand. Let, let's, take, let's just roll through these for a minute. This is sort of the distribution of the current budget. And what you see here is that safety services, police and fire, add up to two-thirds, about 67%. Everything else is one third of the budget. Right. Yeah. That's one. Let's. That's one uh, image. Let's take, go to the next one, please. And uh, there we go. This is over. This is a longitudinal view over a ten-year period. And what you see, and I know it's hard to see, but what you see in the gray bars is departments in the city that where their budgets have gone down. And uh, it's everything except, for all practical purposes, police and fire. Do you want to add anything to that? Well, I think in this time of budget crisis, we cannot ignore the biggest part of our budget. Well, we'll come back to that. I, I, let me just get one other context here. Let's go to the third image, which benchmarks us against nine other cities. And that, these are the sorts of things that I always find, you know, you talk about Cincinnati in a vacuum, you don't know whether it's good, bad, or indifferent. But here against uh, nine other cities, in terms of the percentage of money going to safety service, we're second highest, second highest only to Columbus. So, all right, putting all of those together, what does all of that tell you, Lori? What it tells me and what the numbers show is that most of our city departments, I would say 13 of the 15, have been downsized are doing more with less. I mean, they've seen cuts over the last decade of 10 to 58%. The only thing that has been untouched is the biggest part of our budget, which is the public safety spending. And we need to have the courage to make the cuts there that we need to make to right size so we can move forward because we have great things on the horizon. We are investing and we're ready to okay. thrive and grow, but we have to right size first. Amy, I know that you only, you, you, knew, you were familiar with the, the numbers, the general percentages, yes. but you only saw those images just before we went on air. First off, is, do these reflect what you understand about the Cincinnati budget? Oh, it absolutely does. But what I think you need to look at for police and fire, they both have not had recruit classes for three years. So they are lowering their numbers by attrition. And so we're getting to numbers that are much lower for police and fire. So even though they haven't cut from the budget, we haven't had to have layoffs, they have not had recruit classes and we've had high retirement numbers. So as we have, those people have not been replaced. Well, let me respond to that because she's right. We haven't had recruit classes for a couple of years, but the overall 10-year snapshot is police and fire have still increased in staff and every other department has been cut. So yes, we haven't had recruit classes, but it doesn't make up for the fact that they haven't seen a cut in staff. It seems to me there's a parallel question here, just as the whole question of the political will to cut or to raise that tax rate. Yes. This is one of those other untouchables. Anybody who mentions cutting safety services, fire, especially police, it, it's the third rail. So are you willing, is the conservative majority willing to take a look at serious cuts there? Well, I have to tell you what surprises me though, because people keep looking at police and fire and say, we need to lay off or, or lower the numbers. But the, uh, the, the, some people on council, the council voted not to support SB5. And to be honest, you know, some of the things that we would be able to look at in the budget and be able to manage our budget for police and fire would be in there. And I, I'm not, you know, taking a stand on SB5, but it just surprises me that people who want to lay off and get rid of police and fire will not support or will not even look at, you know, would SB5 be a way to do that also? Well, so I, that kind of surprises record, me. I think SB5 is horrible and I'm definitely against it. And I wish you would have voted for the resolution, you know, against it. But we can do the right thing here. It just takes guts. We're laying off patrol. I mean, I, we need a safe city. I don't think we need to be laying off our police and our fire. So, okay. But we, we, I'm almost out of time, but we got a new fire chief. We're going to have a new police chief. There is an opportunity here 
to, to ask those kinds of questions. I can remember Tom Stryker saying a number of years ago when he was forced to hire 100 extra, he said, I don't want them, I don't need them. Right. And this is going to cause a problem, and here we are. And we're getting really low to our numbers, though, where you know, safety is going to okay. be compromised. I'm out of time. <laughs> Thank you for making Newsmakers a part of your Sunday morning. Join us again next week. I've got a special Fourth of July weekend show about summer camping. It's a great program.